I'm Bill Moyers. The Prime Minister of Jamaica and a man who was born while Queen Victoria was still on the throne of England are my guests this evening for some insights into the interdependence of the world we live in. For several months, I've been traveling to distant parts of the world recording interviews and film reports with people who can add to our understanding of the forces that are shaping life on this planet. My interest in doing this series was partly spurred last fall, when the grown-up leaders of American Little League Baseball announced that henceforth their World Series would be limited strictly to American teams. They didn't say why, but the reason was pretty apparent. Teams from Taiwan and Japan had won seven of the last eight championships and the grown-up leaders of the Little League Baseball organization decided that if you can't beat them, don't play them. So now the World Series of Little League is a closed shop, and the grown-up sponsors are assured that Americans will always come out first. The real world, of course, isn't like that. We're all affected by forces beyond our control and beyond our shores, and our survival isn't going to be played out merely among Americans. So in these programs, we've cast an ear toward men and women of other nations who have something to say about the new ball game, the real World Series in which the human race will win or lose together. Tonight, two views from abroad. This is Michael Manley, the Prime Minister of Jamaica. He leads a small island republic in the Caribbean. For 300 years, Jamaica was a colony of England and only gained its independence 13 years ago. Michael Manley's father was a leader in the independence movement and a former prime minister himself. While Jamaica is small and dependent on tourism and bauxite for the health of its economy, under Manley, the country has begun to assume a role of leadership in what is called the Third World, those largely non-white countries in the southern half of the globe that were once colonies and are now seeking their own path to national pride and economic growth. I talked with the prime minister on the terrace of his home in Jamaica. Why do you consider Jamaica part of the third world? Well, I think that the, the third world is made up of countries that have, a, have shared a certain common historical experience, firstly, and secondly, who are aware of that fact. What is that experience? And that experience, of course, is well documented and talked about, and that is the problem of being part of that formerly colonial empire, which may have been British, may have been French, other parts of Europe, but where the whole of the development of the particular country was stamped by the fact of colonialism with all that that implied in terms of economic development becoming the great sort of producers of raw materials for the world and suffering all the economic disadvantages of imbalanced economic development and political dependency. So I think if you have shared that experience and then have develop the capacity to see that for yourself and to see that it makes you a part of a historical problem, then you are, in fact, a member of the third world. Jamaica has shared that experience, and I hope we are now aware of the fact. You once wrote that all the newly independent territories have found themselves trapped in an economic dilemma. What kind of dilemma? It is the dilemma that flows from being dependent on the production of certain kinds of basic materials, raw materials particularly, like we, for instance, are sugar. There are countries that are dependent on, say, producing cotton. There are all sorts of examples of it. And where, first of all, the, the prices that one commands historically for the export of those things do not move nearly as rapidly as the prices of all the manufactured goods that we, of course, have to import from the great centers like America, Britain, Europe, and the rest of it. And where, as a result, you're constantly transferring wealth from poorer countries to richer countries because you're paying, is really taking more and more sugar to buy a tractor or an automobile or more and more bales of cotton. How do you break out of that dilemma? Well, I don't see any way out of it short of the development of strategies within what we call the framework of a new world economic order. 
What one really means by that is, is, I think, two things. I think one implies something very important in the decision-making process. One is implying that, historically, the great seats of economic power in the so-called metropolitan nations, by the sheer power of their economic influence, have dominated economic decision-making in the world and uh, have, as a, as a consequence, been the beneficiaries of the decisions that are made to the detriment and harm of the so-called third world. But more specifically, I think what one really means to get to the practical implications of it is this. As long as a concept of free market forces determines the price element in world trade, you are going to get the problem of a tendency to buoyant manufactured goods prices as against stagnant staple prices. And therefore, you'll be trapped in the dilemma. So that until you can devise inst international institutions which can begin to negotiate the terms on which goods move from one country to another, you will forever be trapped in the dilemma. Are the third world countries beginning to negotiate those institutions? Oh, clearly. You see, it, the, well, the, I think that the recent agreement between the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, that's the 46 nations that have just made this very important new agreement with the European Economic Community. I think that that agreement is historic what in does its it significance. Do? Well, it does a number of things. It, for example, um, takes quite an important range of products that are vital to these 46 third world countries and guarantees certain kinds of price formulae for their goods, which begin to guarantee adequate returns. Jamaica has always relied on foreign goods, foreign markets, foreign ideas, and foreign outlets for labor. Is that changing? Obviously, one can't ever break out of any, any fundamental alignment of, of, of uh, arrangements quickly. But what, what we are doing is as rapidly as our human and financial resources permit, trying to produce for ourselves the things that we can so as to cut down that degree of foreign dependence. We are also actively seeking opportunities to trade within the third world group, wherever they present themselves. All of which begins to do what we think is critical, which is to break the pattern of total dependence on the metropolitan nexus. You know the old problem about that if um, Washington sneezes, and I mean no disrespect to one of the world's great capitals, if Washington sneezes, everybody else catches a cold. Seems like a joke to an American, but it's a very serious problem of health to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> is that what's meant, you think, by the term interdependence? Well, that is one possible and unfavorable interpretation of the meaning of in, in interdependence. But what we really are, we know perfectly well that nations can never be isolated. We understand this. But what we feel is that to be overly dependent on certain kinds of relationships is unhealthy. And really what we are trying to do is to build up the strongest possible internal base to our economy, which guarantees one kind of freedom of economic action, and then to spread as widely as possible the sort of net of external relationships. And that is why, for example, we are now working out an aluminum complex with Mexico. We think this is very important that we should develop a whole new um, exploitation of bauxite mining and aluminum processing with Mexico as an alternative avenue and outlet for the resource from the traditional North American sources. So much of Jamaica's economy is affected by decisions taken by multinational companies whose headquarters are in, in capitals a long way from here. How does the government of a small country protect its national interest against decisions made in distant capitals? It is extremely difficult, and actually, I think more than anything else, this explains a phenomenon in the world today that is causing both misunderstanding and concern, particularly to metropolitan countries. I refer, for example, to 
what we have actively helped to engineer in the world, which is known as the International Bauxite Association, which is a body that seeks to um, bring into alliance for the development of coherent policies all the major bauxite producing countries of the world. Now, we do this because faced with the problem of the multinational corporation, we find that each small individual country experiences the preemption a lot of a lot of the decision-making process. Very often, Pittsburgh may have a boardroom that is deciding the fate of thousands of Jamaicans, how a critical Jamaican resource should be deployed in the next 10, 15, or 20 years. It is obviously inconsistent with any concept of economic sovereignty. And <clears throat> we find that to try to deal with a, a group of multinational corporations alone is a, is a serious problem. It's very difficult for us. So that we see, therefore, the development of a thing like the International Bauxite Association as partly a necessary element in the attempt to get fair returns for a natural resource like bauxite, to make that an input into the development of a new economic order. We also find it very important as the part of a process by which we begin to retain within Jamaica the decision-making process over our own, own resources, because then you can lock together a number of small countries who have no hostile intentions against anybody. We are not trying to hold anybody to ransom over raw materials. We're not trying to starve out any country by the use of the raw materials as a weapon. We are trying to see that the exploitation of that raw material is carried out in a manner that brings the greatest possible benefit to our people and reflects our own senses, sense of our own national priorities. We recently imposed a levy on our bauxite production in Jamaica. It had the effect of multiplying by eight Jamaica's revenue from the exploitation of, I think, 15 million tons of bauxite a year. We're one of the biggest producers in the world. So where we were getting $25 million a year revenue for all of this bauxite, we're now getting $200 million a year. So this caused a great stir. The effect of that bauxite levy was an increase of less than two cents a pound on the aluminum in the American market. Now that caused a fantastic furore that we were holding America up to ransom. There were congressional hearings about it for the sake of one and a half cents at a time, if I may complete the analogy. At a time when we, a traditional customer for American wheat, paying full market price for the wheat, had what wheat prices go from $67 a ton to $249 a ton. We had what soya beans go from less than $100 a ton to something over $400 a ton. We had watched tractor prices go up by 40, 50, 60%. We were living and being throttled by this price behavior in the American market. And we not retaliated, we just negotiated our small repast, the most gentle of reposts, which added one and a half cents a pound to a 31 cent article in America. And America regarded this as an absolute catastrophe, a confrontation and a challenge to her rights and authority in the world. Take the example of bauxite. You're sitting on one of the richest deposits in the world, and yet most of it is controlled by outsiders. Have you ever considered expropriating the bauxite? No. We have always believed that, um, that if we were going to nationalize a foreign corporation, that we would feel in honor bound to pay a reasonable compensation for the asset that we took over. And I'm assuming that when you said expropriate, you mean to take over without compensation. Now, that's absolutely contrary to our principles, contrary to our constitution, and contrary to our law. Do you think that we are in, in this modern world, for increasing violence? Is violence a part of the world we're going to be living in? I would fear so, and I think it will remain so to the extent that the world won't face the challenge of what I call total social engineering. I think that as long as you live in a world that is at least partially dominated by 
concepts of acquisitiveness, permissiveness, and all the rest of it that sees society as some big sort of thing that is supposed to happen by accident. I know this is contrary to all the classic Western theology. I don't accept the Western theology any longer over this. I think that more and more you've got to, give it, to see the world in terms of deliberate social engineering of security for babies, the daycare centers, the management of an economy that guarantees employment for everybody, that guarantees a reasonable distribution of wealth so that you don't have provocative extremities of wealth and poverty. And I think you've just got to engineer that world. And if you don't engineer that world, I think the acquisitive sort of freewheeling world inevitably is impelled towards violence by the inequities that it produces. One last question. When we were walking into the patio, you said you thought this was an epical period in the evolution of the human race. What did you mean by that? Because I think you're watching um, one of the great transitional periods of history. One of the classic power hegemonies of history has reigned unchallenged. The, you know, the metropolitan north has reigned unchallenged for what is it, 150, 170 years, 200 years. And you are now watching in the emergence of the third world and its capacity to articulate itself as a group and its needs as a group, watching in the discovery of the bargaining power of oil and the OPEC group. You're watching in all of this one of these great transitional moments in history, would you not agree? When a power hegemony is being challenged, not to be necessarily replaced by another power hegemony, but certainly to create a reordering of the disposition of power in the world. What would you say to an American who looks out upon a seething and turbulent world? What would I say to him? Well, I think he would do well to remember what George III might have felt when he faced the uprising. You know, change happens and you get accustomed to it, and England in the end became a great friend and ally of America's. But there was challenge. This time, there doesn't have to be a warlike challenge. And I think that the real key to a lot in the future of the world is to be found in the speed with which America, with its great capacity for adaptation, innovation, its pragmatic common sense, will just apply that common sense to a world that is in the throes of change, where that change can be immeasurably assisted if Americans will understand what they can contribute to it, rather than feel that it is their duty to fight it and resist it. This is what I would say. I really hope you'll help. Michael Manley, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, one of the most impressive political leaders of the new governments that make up the Third World, and a man who believes that interdependence is here to stay.